Good morning. For our gathering today, I want to tell you a story that happened to um, Hank and I back in the 90s. We both worked at Bullock Corporation, and in the good old days, companies used to give employees gifts back then. And each November, we would each get a big old turkey as a thank you for working for them. Well, that gift of a turkey to each one of us turned our house into the Thanksgiving house for both sides of the family. And one year when we were still working at the Bloit Corporation, we worked with a guy who shared that he had nowhere to go for Thanksgiving. Well, that bothered me greatly. And Hank and I talked about inviting him to our house and, and we both said that there's no way either one of us would go to another family's Thanksgiving by ourselves. But we thought, you know what, let's make the offer. And boy, did he jump at it. And we set another place at our table. Now, he came that year just a little merrier than the rest of us. He was so grateful to be included. And he was so nice to everyone that our families actually behaved a little better, too. And it was a really good day. It was the kind of day that leaves a good imprint on your heart that stays with you for years. Throughout the years, then, we kind of made it a tradition to seek out somebody who'd be alone on Thanksgiving and invite them to ours. Most of our best remember when stories of Thanksgiving past are about the time when a guest was there. Perhaps the most notable is the time I made blue turkey and nobody, nobody mentioned it as they dished up that the turkey was blue. <laughs> community, especially Christian community, is at the heart of being a church. And this year, we are entering into our stewardship season, focusing on communion at the Lord's table. Now, it may seem surprising to think about stewardship in connection with passages that focus on the bread and the cup, but Jesus tells us that these are visible signs of God's generosity towards us. At the table, we receive. At the table, we give. We share what we have received by giving it to others. And it's at the table that we learn how to live together. For the next four weeks, we're going to look at four different passages that focus on God's table and what happens there. When we eat the bread and when we drink the cup, we embrace God's unconditional love as the basis for our lives. And we commit ourselves to live in God's way of love. So to prepare for worship today, consider the guests who have been at your table and open your heart to the spirits leading to who you welcome to your table. December 12, 1967, I was just a newborn. I was less than three months old, just a babe in my mom's arms. Reminds me of Jesus at Christmas. Now I know for a fact that I wasn't like Jesus because my folks said I cried all the time, but I digress. This isn't about me. This is about what happened on December 12th, 1967. It was the day a film was released called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. It starred Sidney Poitier, who was wanting to marry Catherine Houghton. And just a little trivia for you, Catherine Houghton was actually Catherine Hepburn's niece, and she was hoping to give her a big break in this movie. But of course, we have a conflict, right? When we have a guest to feed at dinner, the obvious dilemma of this movie is there is another mouth to feed. No, of course not. This film was controversial because it tackled the subject of interracial marriage. And it was released at a time when it was illegal in many states for interracial marriage to take place. It was still illegal in 17 states until June 12th, 1967 just a mere six months before the film came out. Now at the time, no one was sure how the film would be received, but it turns out people liked it and it was a huge hit. And I think because the film addresses everyone's perspectives, but also challenges them is one of the reasons why. And it really does a good job of that. And the movie ends with this family all heading into the dining room table to share their first meal together as a family. And we're left with the feeling that maybe, just maybe, this is going to work out after all. It's going to be okay. Maybe black and white people can live together, can even fall in love. Now, that was 55 years ago. If I asked you today, guess who's coming to dinner, who do you think it would be? 
Our culture is struggling to understand and accept same-sex marriage. And we've not even overcome that hurdle yet, and another is right in our path. Our culture has added in being non-binary into the fold for us to wrestle with. And yet, we're being asked to meet these people at the table, which we consider a safe place for most of us. Our table is filled with our friends, our family, people like us. And letting a stranger come to the table is risky. It's dangerous and it could be disastrous. Now throughout history, meals around a table have symbolized and created bonds of trust. The Lord's Supper, the first Thanksgiving, these are just two examples of historic meals. People who ate together typically did so as a community and either eating together created identity. Common meals also defined social boundaries among communities. You know where you belonged when you joined someone at the table. So to eat regularly with a group was typically to become a part of that group and its principles and its practices. Eating together created social bonds and was often the occasion where very important conversations took place. Around the table, guests see themselves as equals, as peers, as kindred spirits on their journeys. And eating together generates a sense of community. Now, if you don't think that's true, all you have to do is go back to high school and walk into any lunchroom. The lunchroom at high school can be the most terrifying room at school if you're alone or new, or it can be the most comforting place at the day where you go and meet up with your friends who are like you. The table is more than just a place to set our tray or eat our food. It's where life happens. So I wanna take a look today at our scripture about the Lord's Supper that we're gonna look at in the series. First one from Matthew 26, 17 to 30. And I want you to listen to all that's taking place in this passage. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So according to Matthew, we find Jesus having his Passover celebratory, celebratory meal with his closest friends. Now this scene could honestly be any one of our homes during the holidays, right? Because Passover wasn't and isn't still just about the meal they ate or the wine they drank. Because Passover was, and remains for the Jews, one of the major holidays, celebrating the exodus from Egypt and all that God did to rescue his people. Tremendous preparation was involved, and in traditions must have been adhered to in honor to celebrate this correctly. And even though Jesus has called this dinner together rather hastily, preparations throughout the town would have already been started. And the disciples make sure that everything they need and is necessary is in place for this to be a, a proper celebration. 
Now this is a celebration and the mood is light because the disciples still don't understand this last supper idea, but they do know how to celebrate the Passover. So there's food, there's laughing, there's celebrating, there's sharing stories, there's eating and drinking and a good time. But then in the middle of it all, Jesus drops a bomb on everybody by saying, hey, you know what? Somebody came to dinner who's a little sketchy. <laughs> You know who that is? Actually, what he says is, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. And with that, the mood drastically changes at this dinner. Things turn so somber. And even though Jesus doesn't name Judas at that moment, he does say, boy, it's terrible to be him. And that pushes Judas over the line. He knows that Jesus knows exactly what's going on. And Jesus doesn't have to point at him and declare, you, you're the sinner. Because just as Jesus knows that Judas is the betrayer, he knows that Judas regrets what he did or will soon. So instead of refusing to eat with Judas, he still had a place for him waiting at the table. Even though Jesus knew Judas was selling him out, he still welcomed him to his table. Now, what happened next is kind of weird, but we've all had family dinners that have gotten kind of weird, right? It's difficult to move on after an outburst or an argument where everyone doesn't know how to go on, right? But these guys must have been hungry because Matthew says they go back to eating. And this is where Jesus initiates for us this new celebration that starts that night. And we see through the very Jewish eyes of Matthew what this now means for us going forward. Now, during a customary Passover Seder or meal, there are four cups of wine present at the meal, and they are reflective of the four promises that God made in Exodus 6, 6 and 7 to save the Israelites, to redeem his people. And they stand for sanctifi sanctification, the fact that God redeems us in spite of our sin, the second cup stands for, in some literature, judgment, other literature, deliverance, meaning the same thing, that God removes our sin. And the third cup is the cup of redemption, which gives us new life, another chance. And then the fourth cup of praise or restoration, that God and his people have been reunited. Now, each of these cups are drank at specific times throughout the meal, with scriptures read along with them. We actually had a Seder meal at our church several years ago on Monday, Thursday, and it was a really enlightening and eye-opening of all that they do to honor this holiday. But the point being that as the meal progresses, you're supposed to be getting a greater and greater appreciation for God's redemption. But on this night in our scripture, at the Last Supper, the night before Jesus' execution, he makes a change to this tradition. Jesus says that now his blood is the cup of redemption poured out for us. He says, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the fourth cup, the cup of restoration, will not be drunk again until they're all together in heaven. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fourth cup of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The redemption that Christ gives us leads us to restoration. And the restoration is completed when we get to heaven. Now we see once again that Jesus doesn't come and disregard tradition or history. He instead immerses himself in it alongside his fellow Jews, honoring and respecting his father's law. But then Jesus makes one little adjustment by saying that cup three is the end for now. No longer will blood sacrifices be required for the forgiveness of sins because Christ's blood is shed once and for all. And that fourth cup, we're going to all wait and take that together when the second coming comes and Jesus has victory over earth. Now, Matthew is our author today, and Matthew is very much a Jew. 
and Matthew portrays Jesus' ministry as a fulfillment of the Jewish Old Testament scripture promises. Matthew wants people to trust that Jesus is the Messiah and they should listen to him. Prior to chapter 26, Matthew has recorded all kinds of Jesus' teachings. And to Matthew, they are a continuation of the call that the Old Testament makes to care for the poor and those who are at risk among you. And Jesus is preparing to die soon, and the disciples need to be faithful and continue his work. He tells them stories about keeping their lamps lit, that they are the light of the world. He tells them stories about using their gifts. He warns them about hypocrisy, and he talks to them about sheep and goats. All of these stories are significant to those men sitting around the table. Because of the fact that they've chosen to join Jesus there means they identify with him and his cause. Participating in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper means they are committing themselves to his way. And Jesus declares that he is with them always, even when not there physically. And by taking his body and his blood, we are agreeing to this covenant that Jesus sets forth. Now, the fact that we do this once a month is to remind us of what a great gift this is from God. God uses bread and wine to help us remember that Jesus paid the price for us. The tearing of the bread reminds us of the beaten and broken body that Jesus endured. And the cup reminds us of his blood shed for the awful things that we continue to do. Now, this particular Passover celebration has taken on a new dimension, one that remains for Christianity to this day. And from it, we are assured by Jesus that we are part of his covenant family. When we eat the bread, when we drink the cup, we receive both his love and grace. And we commit ourselves then to discipleship, which includes being faithful servants and stewards of all he's given us. If we come to Jesus' table, we are committing ourselves to the community that exists there. We're joining that community. Now, in a moment, we're going to all come before Jesus' table. And we come invited as guests. We come welcomed as friends. And we come forgiven as children. But most importantly, we become loved. We come loved as family. You will once again be offered the gift of the bread, symbolizing Jesus' body broken for you. Today, when you hold that piece of bread in your hand, Remember how much Jesus loves you. Think about the fact that he was willing to be beaten, mocked, scourged, and humiliated for you. And when you take the cup while you are holding it, think about his love spilling out in your life. As you drink, remember that through his blood, we get to know forgiveness and restoration. As you take communion this morning, be mindful of heaven touching earth the moment that you eat and drink. In those moments, we experience the full impact of his sacrifice made real for us. The exchange should actually be a little overwhelming for us, if we're honest. Jesus suffering and in death in exchange for our eternity is no small thing. His great sacrifice for us to live in the new covenant in his blood shed for the forgiveness of our th sins, is a tremendous gift. Another tradition in our fellowship around communion is for us to serve one another. When we serve one another the loaf and the cup, we act out the first step of discipleship in our lives. At the table of Jesus, we learn how to receive and therefore give. Stewardship is all about using our gifts and resources for the benefit of Jesus Christ. And Jesus invites us first to his table to experience the love and grace of his sacrifice. And being at that table among friends, being loved, being forgiven, being empowered, that's where we learn to live life in a new way, as a new body, as a new fellowship formed by God himself. And we learn at the table that it isn't so important what we put on the table 
But what is important is who we welcome around our table and what they also learn by being there, what they experience by being a part of our table and then what they will do with that gift. As you join together at the table of Jesus today, let it be a moving experience. One where you come to the table as one person, but leave differently. One where you come to the table to be fed, but you leave hungry to feed others. And one where you know that you are loved unconditionally and completely without exception. Prepare your heart to come to the table. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for the gift of the Last Supper. So much is happening there, Lord, that it is hard for us to take it all in. And yet the meaning is clear. The table is so important in our lives. You invite us to it. You invite others to it. And when we sit down and see each other face to face, this is where we learn to live and to love together. Lord, as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, may it be different for us. May it truly give us a moment to reflect on this gift and what it means for us as stewards of Jesus Christ, that he has given this to us. We give you all praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me now in our prayer of confession before communion. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess that we are sinners in need of a savior. We have broken your commandments and have each gone our own way. Forgive us and restore us according to your loving grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Know that you are forgiven, that Christ has done this on our behalf and given you forgiveness that sets you free to be his disciple. The Lord be with you. Lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we know that on the night that Christ gathered his 12 together, he took the bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you do so, take it and remember what I endured for you. As we take the gift of the bread this day, may it be for us truly the body of Christ broken for us. Gracious Lord, we ask for your blessing to be poured out on the gift of this bread that as we take it today, we would be mindful, Lord, of what it cost our Lord to bring it to us. Amen. Take and eat. When the meal was winding down, Christ took the cup, as we now know is the third cup. And he said, I now make a new covenant with you this day. This is now my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. So every time that you drink from this cup, you do so in remembrance of me. You agree to be my disciple and I give you my blessing, he says. So as we drink of this cup, may it pour into our souls all of our forgiveness and grace and mercy, releasing us to love the Lord as much as he loves us. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon the gift of this cup, that as we take it today, it would truly be the blood of Christ washing away our iniquity and freeing us to live in joy in your path. In Jesus' name, amen. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Would you please now join with me in our closing prayer after communion? Let us pray. Gracious God, we have been redeemed by the body and blood of your only son. Your word promises us the forgiveness of sin and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit through our participation in the Lord's Supper. We offer our thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning, and I pray that you have a beautiful week ahead of you. May God be with you at your table and wherever you go. Amen.